Hi everyone, we are Project 6, Trace Formula for Graphs. Over the past month, we have learned a lot of stuff, so today we will be sharing those with you. Um, my name is C. I will be introducing you to the Trace Formula, introducing you to some of the techniques that we have used, and hopefully motivating what we're doing a little bit. So to start us off, let's begin with an example. What is a Trace Formula? This is an example of a trace formula from linear algebra. It just states that the trace of a matrix, which is the sum of all the diagonal entries, will be the same as the sum of all eigenvalues of this matrix. Um, we call the multiset of all eigenvalues of the matrix the spectrum of the matrix. Now, an important fact about this equation is that the equality holds no matter what basis we're in. So no matter what basis I write my matrix A in, the trace will remain invariant. And this is an important fact that we can take advantage of in as a proof technique. So this is a famous, famous formula called the Poisson summation formula. We take a finite abelian group G and some subgroup gamma to give a, some function F. And then we are able to relate its discrete Fourier transform with F itself in this way. Now, I will outline the proof, but I will not have time to give too much detail on the representation theory behind it, but hopefully you will get, understand where exactly I used this identity in the proof. So firstly, we, give, we take our F and we use this formula to Fourier transform it. Now, a representation, the definition of a representation is that it is a group homomorphism from our group G to some general linear group of some vector space. So the specific representation that we have chosen here is the induced one, induced from the subgroup gamma, and it acts like this. Um, the important step now comes where we compute the trace of f hat of rho in two different bases. So firstly, we compute it in the delta basis. Delta basis is just these set of delta functions that identify where the elements of G are. And computing this gives us this expression where um, we're summing over only elements of gamma because by the induced representation, we are actually invariant on the cosets of gamma. And that's why we're summing over gamma itself. And then we compute over the character basis. Um, a character is also a group homomorphism but instead of our target space being the general linear group, it is just the one dimensional, the multiplicative group of complex numbers. So up here we have C star, which is the, just the plane of complex numbers minus zero itself. Thus, we actually see that this is the eigenbase, which means all of these characters chi are actually the eigenfunctions of the of F hat. And so we get that these are precisely the eigenvalues, and we sum over this. This is the spectral side of our, uh, of our trace formula. And now, finally, we just put these two computations together, rearrange the coefficients, pull the, the g on, on here over to this side, and we end up with this formula. This formula is very, very useful. We saw proofs using this to prove the, we proved a, um, inversion formula for the Jacobi theta function, as well as a functional equation for the Riemann zeta function. Both was proved, both can be proved using this Poisson summation formula. So now we zoom out a little bit and we ask, since we worked with finite abelian groups here, what happens in the non-abelian case? Can we generalize this further? And the answer is yes, there is a non-abelian analog to the Poisson summation formula, and it is called the Selberg trace formula. If we look at the essence, the soul of trace formula, essentially we are taking an operator and we are relating its spectral information, the spectrum, and to some geometric thing going on in the underlying space in the, with the operator itself. So the, the Selberg trace formula considers the Laplacian operator of the hyperbolic space, discrete or continuous, and it relates it to geometric things such as number of paths of a certain kind or the length of these paths. 
So to further expand on this, I will now pass it on to Maggie. Hi, my name is Yuan Lu. So C has just talked about an introduction to the trace formula. So I will continue to talk uh, Poincaré upper half plane and the K regular trees, as well as a trace formula called the Selberg trace formula for K regular graphs. Uh, so the Poincaré upper half plane is defined to be a set of all complex numbers where the imaginary part is greater than zero. We can define the metric tensor on H by ds squared is equal to dx squared plus dy squared divided by y squared. So we can define the length of a curve uh, by this metric tensor using this metric tensor. And also we can define the distance of two points to be the infimum of all the lengths of the curves from the initial point to the end point. So this actually gives a metric and then the geodesic on H can be found to be the all the circular arcs perpendicular to the x axis and the straight vertical rays perpendicular to the x axis. We have an important proposition which says that PSL2 of R uh, acts on H transitively and isometrically by Mobius transformation. So here, uh, isometrically, uh, here isometrically means just means that it preserves uh, this metric. And the PSL2 of R is just the SL2 of R mod plus or minus I. And the Mobius transformation is defined as such that if gamma is ABCD in SL2 of R and tau is in H, then gamma of tau is defined to be A tau plus B divided by C tau plus D. The stabilizer of I it can be found to be SO of 2, the special orthogonal group. And as a result, by orbit stabilizer theorem, H can be identified with PSL2 of R mod SO of 2. And uh, the Poincaré upper half plane is actually very, very like the regular graphs. So if G is, uh, I mean, K regular trees, if G is VE, uh, an undirected graph with a set of vertices V and a set of edges E, we say that G is K regular if every vertex has the degree K. And for convention, we know k to be q plus one for technical reason. We say that g is a tree if any two vertices can be connected by one and only one path. It is connected if any two vertices can be connected by at least one path. Uh, so if x is q plus one regular connected graph, then the universal covering graph x tilde, which contains the set of all walks without back backtracking from uh, an origin and a fixed point O as vertices, the set of all edges of the form P1, P2, where P1 is an extension of P2 by one edge, this uh, universal covering graph X tilde becomes a K regular tree. And also K is just Q plus one. So the Salberg trace formula for K regular graphs uh, states that if, if X is a Q plus one regular connected graph and X tilde is its universal covering tree, and then uh, the left hand side is equal to the right hand side. So the left hand side uh, is the spectral side. Uh, f, f hat is the spherical transform of f. And the right hand side is more complicated where uh, p gamma is, is, the, is the set of all primitive hyperbolic conjugacy classes of gamma. And nu encodes a geometric information of the geodesics and HF is another geometric transformation called the horocycle transformation. So all these concepts are hard to explain without uh, knowing a lot of information about the K regular trees. So I will skip this part. And uh, the important thing is that this actually is, uh, is an example of the trace formula for K regular graphs. And uh, later, Dr. will continue talking on spectral graph theory. Hi, I'm Dr. I'm going to talk about some basic spectral graph theory. So for a graph X, uh, which has an adjacency matrix, uh, A encodes how vertices are connected. So uh, the entry AIJ is one if uh, uh, the vertex vi and vertex vj are connected and zero otherwise and so the eigenvalues or spectrum of this uh, matrix is called the spectrum of the graph so a simple example of this is with uh, the complete graph uh, k4 on four vertices uh, each pair of vertexes uh, distinct vertices is connected 
and so in this case we get this uh, four by four uh, adjacency matrix with uh, all ones except along the diagonal and uh, the spectrum you can calculate it in the usual way that you would of a matrix so uh, coming to another uh, related construction to the adjacency matrix the laplacian of a graph uh, so if we let d be a diagonal matrix where di uh, the di diagonal entry is the degree of vertex i it's the number of edges going out of vertex i then uh, we define the laplacian as uh, d minus a where a was the adjacency matrix and so this uh, matrix basically gives us a discrete version of the usual Laplace operator uh, on you, for example, Euclidean spaces and so on. And uh, Balaj will talk more about why we're interested in this. So, uh, coming back to the spectrum of a graph, it's uh, natural to wonder what we can learn from the spectrum. And we can learn a lot about the paths in the graph uh, using the spectrum. For example, we can calculate the number of edges uh, using the trace of A squared. Uh, and if you think a bit about it, the trace of A squared is, uh, as uh, C also told us, is the sum of uh, the squared eigenvalues of A. Uh, and so uh, this is in fact a piece of spectral information and we can do this for triangles uh, trace of a cubed and so on and this is one of the calculations that's important in uh, the cell book trace formula for graphs uh, and so another question very natural to wonder about is uh, is a uh, graph completely determined by spectrum can we d distinguish two graphs based on the spectrums and the answer is in fact no uh, we can have two graphs which are very uh, are fundamentally different but uh, uh, have the same spectrum so the graph on the left uh, for example has uh, a vertex with two loops at a single vertex but the graph on the right does not and so they are not isomorphic they are fundamentally different but they in fact if you calculate it have the same spectrum and so it's uh, very again natural to wonder how one would think about such a graph and uh, the way we come up with such examples is uh, okay is the construction of Cayley graphs so Cayley graphs give us a way to go from groups to graphs. Uh, so if we start with the group G and the generating set S for G, uh, then the Cayley graph is uh, defined as uh, taking the vertices to be the elements of G and we uh, take the edges, uh, we connect G to H if uh, G inverse H lands in uh, capital S, the, it's a generating element. And uh you can see basically what this looks like very simply with z mod 4z and the generating set 1 comma 3 uh, uh, in this example we get a nice uh, square uh, you can think about what we will get with z mod and z and the same generating set and more generally for we can do this with any gra uh, group and get interesting graphs uh, like the two that uh, we just saw before. Um, now Balaj will talk about heat kernels. Hello, my name is Balaj Nemeth, and in the last section of our presentation, I will talk about heat kernels. The following partial differential equation is called the heat equation, where f is a function of time and space representing temperature, and this is a very important equation in mathematical physics because it models diffusion of heat through a given region, or more generally a manifold, as time evolves. Delta is the Laplace operator. In n-dimensional Euclidean space, it is given by the sum of the second partial derivatives with respect to the Cartesian coordinates. To solve this equation, one usually studies the so-called fundamental solution, where um, this fundamental solution can be thought of as putting a unit amount of heat uh, at t equals zero at position y, and observing how this distribution evolves as time goes on. Formally, one should impose the initial condition that as t time goes to zero, t 
this uh, function should tend to the Dirac delta distribution delta x minus y. But uh, k encodes a lot of information about the domain u, and we shall explore this further. In n-dimensional Euclidean space, the fundamental solution is the Vernon Gaussian distribution. On a compact connected domain U, um, the uh, spectrum of the Laplace operator is discrete. Um, and if we have the spectrum as lambda n and the corresponding eigenfunctions fn, then motivated by Fourier's ideas, we can form uh, the following eigenfunction expansion of the fundamental solution. Uh, on the circle S1, which is uh, R quotiented by Z, we have the following expansion, because the eigenvalues of the Laplacian are simply the squares of the natural numbers, and uh, the eigenfunctions are just given by complex exponentials. If we uh, symmetrize the fundamental solution, the Gaussian, uh, on R to make it periodic, and compare it with the above expression for the fundamental solution on S1, then by the uniqueness of heat kernel, we get the following identity, um, which is the functional equation for the Jacobi theta function. And it was pointed out by C that this can also be proven using a Poisson summation formula. But more generally, if we have a lattice gamma on the plane, where uh, gamma is an additive subgroup generated by two linearly independent vectors, and gamma squared is its dual lattice, and m, which is the quotient of the plane by this lattice, then we have the following uh, identity, uh, which can be proven analogously um, as above. Um, this is a trace formula, because on the left-hand side, we have terms containing the spectrum of the Laplacian, these values, 4 pi squared, the magnitude of nu squared, with the length of closed geodesics on m, which are these values, the magnitude of gamma. Now the question is, can we find an analog for graphs? And it turns out we can, um, because um, if we have a q plus 1 regular graph x with discrete Laplace operator L as introduced by Dutch, then we can form a discrete analog of the heat equation, where we just replace the continuous Laplacian with this discrete graph Laplacian. Now the heat kernel, which is the analog of the fundamental solution, is an operator in this case, which is defined to be the exponential of this Laplace operator. Um, this can be seen by formally integrating uh, this equation, and the heat kernel has the following uh, power series expansion. Note that in the finite dimensional case, L can be represented by a real symmetric matrix Q plus 1 times I minus A in the standard basis. We can take the trace of this heat kernel in two ways. First, using this uh, eigenbasis, because L uh, can be represented by a real symmetric matrix. Uh, it has real eigenvalues and the corresponding eigenbasis. And this trace will just be the sum of these exponentials over the spectrum of L. While we can also use the definition of the heat kernel to compute this trace. And uh, we will find the following um, infinite sum. And this is a trace formula for graphs, because on the left-hand side, we have spectral terms containing uh, information about the spectrum of the Laplacian on the graph. And on the right-hand side, we have geometric terms, because as Daksh explained, these values, the trace of a to the n, are the number of closed walks of length n on the graph. Thank you very much for your attention.